I work for Ardman Animations in Bristol. I've been there for the past 13 years. I'm currently working as a production manager on a number of features and broadcast projects. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is a brief sort of introduction talk about our last feature film, Pirates. Um, I think in the, uh, the description it says uh, enhancing the animation experience. I'm not sure I'll be doing that, but um, I'm going to be telling you all about the process we go through uh, to make our films at Aardman. Um, so Pirates uh, was released earlier, uh, sorry, earlier, earlier this year. Um, in total, it was a five years uh, in production. The first two of those years were in development. Um, it was version eight of our script internally that was put into production by Sony um, with a budget of 55 million US dollars. Um, once we got the green light on the project, we then went into post, uh, sorry, pre-production. Uh, that was 15 months before we then started shooting. During our pre-production periods uh, is the build of our puppets, worlds, and also storyboarding, that, those aspects of our film. Uh, then we did an 18-month shoot. Uh, at its biggest point, we had 41 shooting units working uh, at one time uh, over the 78 week period um, and then we had a three month post-production period at the end of the project. Um, so the basis of what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be accompanied by a film. Uh, basically it's like a studio tour of our building in Bristol. Uh, it was shot whilst we were making the project um, and it starts off by showing you the stages uh, that we go through to create each of the shots. Uh, so the first thing you'll see is a storyboard image. Um, so basically a hand-drawn image. Um, the storyboarding in animation is incredibly important. Um, script doesn't give us the information we require to logistically plan our projects. And also because we are dealing with projects that stretch out over kind of many many years it's also before we start filming we want to make sure not only working logistically but also creatively so the animatic as we call it this cut together drawn version of the film helps us define the story um, but that said we often in fact on every film I've worked on at Aardman we always start the project before the entire animatic stroke storyboarding phase is finished so it's often the case that when we're filming Act 1, we're working on Act 2 in story. When we're filming Act 2, we're finalising the film. So in order to keep the, the number of years these things take to do to a, a minimum, he says at five years, um, we're constantly working on top of each other. So this storyboard is constantly evolving throughout the process, which is problematic, but kind of a necessary evil to get the films made. Um, then what you will see is previs. Uh, first on Pirates is the first time we've tried using previs. We previs every single shot of the film, so 1,500 shots. Uh, and the reason for that was to aid the directors so that when the camera crews were setting up the next shot in a unit, they could literally refer to previs and hopefully get the camera 75% in the right place before the director came on set. So basically we used it as an efficiency tool uh, so that a lot of our key decisions were made up front of the director visiting the set. Previously we would have waited with the camera down on the floor, then the director comes in, sets the camera. Um, but obviously when you've got 33 animators to see and keep moving every day, a, a visit of only 15 minutes soon multiplies into quite a large bulk of the director's time. So that's why we introduced that process. Uh, also Pirates was... Um, a more complex film maybe than we've done before with a lot of CG elements and it was a good way to visualise those, uh, the practicalities of those elements and also it, it gave us a, a clearer sense of where we were going with the project. Uh, then you'll see the final shot as it left the studio floor so it have green screen visible, uh, rigs coming out of the characters, uh, there'll be no sea or any kind of background skies and then finally you'll see the final shot as it exists um, in the film. So we'll start the video now, please, and uh, I'll just talk over it as required.
Is there any value? I am the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. Aha! I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. Here we go, lads! Look and learn! Yeah! Ha! Go again, pirate captain! Avast! I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. Here we go, lads! Look and learn! Pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. Here we go, lads. Look and learn. Yeah. Ha! Go again, pirate captain. Ross. I'm the pirate captain, and I'm here for your gold. So there you go. You do that 1,500 times, and you've got an animated film. Um, but before you can do any of that, um, everything at Ardman starts on the drawing board. So Norman Garwood was our production designer, and every single location and set was kind of visualised by him to try and find the humour in it uh, and to kind of give guidance for our art department team. So he would always work in black and white, then colourists would go on to work on it. Um, but then we also had a team of four production art directors who were basically putting together the sets as kind of practical models. Uh, we used a lot of MU, so mock-ups, so that before we build the final thing, the director can look at it and decide how it's going to work in the scene. Uh, these are just made with foam core often at a reduced scale. Basically a very cheap and quick way of um, exploring ideas before we commit to build. Uh, so this is Norman looking round our studio at our biggest set we made for Pirates, which was Blood Island. It had 22 buildings in total, uh, and to give it a sense of scale, um, it was about 50 feet wide and about 75 feet in length. Uh, that was just the set elements, and then it took up all of our third studio, so about 6,000 square feet of studio space. Um, a very similar process happens in model making. Everything is drawn first by the character designer. Um, but then we go into a process called sculpt, where we make very, well not quick, not relatively quick, um, clay models um, to get the shape and weight of the characters. Um, and once these are made, they can be broken down into the constituent elements and uh, then built into our final puppets. So it's, Everything you see in Ardman's films has to be made. Nothing, nothing exists at the start of production. Inside each of the... Um, actually, you know, this is um, also... When I say everything has to be made, that goes down to like filling the sets which we create as well. So we made lots and lots of miniature glass work plates, knives, forks, because once we've got the sets and the models, they also need kind of the things that fill their worlds as well, pictures, etc. Um, what the gentleman here is talking about is uh, the foaming process. So inside of each character is a metal skeleton um, over which foam is then moulded uh, to give the, the form of the character. Um, the foam is normally in the base colour of the, the element that it's making, so his coat is red all the way through, so if any paint does come off, it doesn't notice in the final shot. Uh, Foaming is a very inaccurate process, so it goes into ovens basically to uh, dry out, um, and sometimes it shrinks too much, develops bubbles in it, so um, often you'll do several of these before getting a perfect one out that is used in the final film. So over that base colour, which is provided by the foam, you get uh, the painting on top to give all the detail. So what you just saw there was all the elements that go into building one of our pirate captain models. Um, his beard was a process that took around 12 months to develop and build the beard uh, to work exactly as it, we needed it to. Uh, we made somewhere in the region of 490 puppets for pirates uh, with a team of around 100 people working over around three years on that. And this is just a selection of those characters here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, from a kind of design point of view, it's also very important at Ardman that we always not only build in the characters in, as an individual element, but also as a group, that they look like they inhabit the same world, that they look in their world real, as it were. So we're often doing a lot of lineups, testing them on sets to make sure all these elements that we're creating individually across the team all tie together. Um, you saw there, this is the puppet store. Uh, we had about 19 pirate captains in the costume you can see here, plus specials on top of that. Um, the next process you're gonna see is RP. Um, basically, uh, the pirate captain's mouth is made of a hard resin which um, is scanned into the computer from a series of hand-carved mouths. Uh, we then create a complete mouth set for the captain, all the phonetic shapes in the computer, uh, and select which ones we want to use in the film. So this is made in Maya. Uh, then it is directed, uh, approved by the director uh, before being printed out in a, with a process called rapid prototyping. Uh, what that allowed us to do on Pirates was make, help the animators to work quicker and you have more characters in each shot. Plaster seems a very time consuming process but with RP it means you can move much quicker because it's only a case of removing the mouth and putting the next one on. Um, so that's it there coming out of the printer. Each one of these mouths, we made somewhere in the region of 30,000 for Pirates. Um, and they need to be hand finished, so all the little edges sort of um, sanded down off them and then painted so they have an undercoat, the teeth are painted by hand tongues and then finished so that they're resistant to sort of constant touching. So this is the RP workshop. We also had a team of librarians who managed these mouths. We found out early on in the process that we we didn't have enough time to build a full mouth set for every single character. So we had to basically select from the lines of dialogue the mouth shapes we were likely to need and only make those ones. So that was a constantly adapting process, the build schedule. Um, you can see here the sort of scale of it. Um, the room which you can see on the video is our RP library where those mouths were held. And so each animator has delivered a box of mouths at the start of the shot. Uh, in order to complete the work they needed to do. Um, this bit you can see here is the mouth going through its iterations from being chosen in the computer to being put onto the character on the studio floor. You'll notice a small join line across the top. Uh, that remains until the shot goes into VFX where that's painted out by our team CG artists. Um, and because we were working in 3D on this project basically that always had to be done twice for the left and right eyes that we we're creating. Uh, so here, this area you can see here is our build area of a company called Cod Stakes in Bristol. We built 63 locations for Pirates, um, which were all created at Cod's and then brought into our studios in North Bristol. Uh, the process was basically an 18 week one, uh, 16 weeks of design and build, uh, sorry design when we were um, like working with the directors to design it and creating the final plans. Then Cod Stakes would have a six week build period and then it would be delivered to the studio uh, to be assembled and put together by our team of in-house set dressers which was another six weeks uh, and at that point, at the end of that period, then it would be ready for an animator to work on it. It's kind of difficult to see the scale there of that, but that's the one I was mentioning earlier, which is like 6,000 square feet of studio space with that set in it. A lot of these sets also come apart in various ways and can be manipulated um, so that the animators, one, can get access, access for lights, um, but also we reuse the sets constantly. So the 27 houses that we built for London are uh, reused time and time again. We shoot different passes, uh, redress the doors, put different windows in, maybe change the slates on the roof to make them look different. So what we're always trying to do is get as much use out of every element we build because obviously it's quite expensive 
to build these elements and we want to get as much out of them as we can. This is Queen Victoria's throne room, uh, one of the more complicated sets. Basically, we only built one half of it and then you would redress it to look like the other half. This shot you see here was shot as a number of elements because it would be impossible to get the animator in there to manipulate the puppets. So it was shot first off with no gold in and the character action, then the gold dressed in. Uh, so I think in total it's about seven passes. Uh, we also use a lot of specialist craftsmen, metalwork, glass blowers, etc., to build certain elements of the film because uh, it's they know what they're doing. It's much cheaper and more efficient to get it out to someone who's a professional in certain areas uh, so wrought iron work etc although done on a smaller scale uh, it's still by, done by a local wrought iron company all the skies that you see in pirates are put in digitally so digital, digital sight painting um, rather than traditional hand painted skies here you can see some of the props that are created by our in-house props. And I think we had about 12 prop makers working on the project over about three years. The set you can see here, uh, or you just saw then, was the kitchen. Uh, that was one of the few sets we did what we call multipling, where we build repeats of the same set. Uh, the reason for doing that was that there was so much of that location to film towards the end of the project that we had to build, a, I think we built five kitchen sets in total and had about ten animators working over them in different areas of the studio to get it all done in the time we had. Uh, and that leads us in to the animator section. So basically, the shoot rate for the animators, if an animator produces five seconds in a week of finished footage, that's a good week. Um, for us, um, so about 1.2 seconds a day. Um, we shoot on what's called doubles, so what that means is every two frames we make a movement of the character, so for every second you see on film there will be one manipulation of the character or group of characters in the shot. Um, and in some of these cases the sets, because they're quite big, the animator has to crawl onto the set manipulate the character, then come back out again, check it on the monitor, then go back in again. It's very, it's quite a physical process. Um, I think a lot of people don't kind of realise that when they watch these films, kind of how difficult it is for the animators kind of in terms of kind of keeping these things moving and alive over such a long period. Um, so, these are the cameras we used on the project. Uh, we used the Canon 1D Mark III uh, with some Nikon and lights lenses uh, which were rehoused for our purposes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we also shot in 3D. So each camera was mounted upon a small tracker rig which allowed us to move it between a left eye and a right eye. Um, so basically we take one image and then track three millimeters as an average and take the second eye. The reason for that distance three millimeters uh, in stereo filmmaking is called the interocular and basically our interocular is scaled down to our character's world so as in with us it would be say a centimeter and a half for them it's only three millimeters but you can adjust that in the to get a kind of bigger or less than the 3D effect uh, as, as you need to. Um, our studio was also networked as well, so each animator works on a tower which captures the image. Then you have a basically a monitoring system which is taking every frame that's grabbed by the animator, processing it in its into its final file format and making it available in edit. The reason for doing that is that the director's time is so precious with so many people to see every day. When an animator finishes shot, you don't want to be processing like 200 frames or whatever until the animator, uh, until the director can see it. You want the last frame to come in and then the shot to be ready in viewing in the viewing theatre, both in 2D and 3D, also in Avid. So there's kind of 
quite a lot of background infrastructure that goes into these projects. Um, what you can see here is um, what we call the lav rehearsals. Part of the animation process is basically the animators acting out each shot before they're filmed um, to kind of completely nail down the, uh, the process or, or the, the, the characterization rather than the process. Uh, the reason for doing that is that obviously when someone's only doing five seconds a week, you don't want to get to the end of a 30 second shot six weeks down the line and find out there's something fundamentally wrong with it, that the action, the emotion in it isn't correct. So the process goes along these lines of basically you act it out in the lab, then you do a block, which is where the animator does a very, very rough version of the shot. Uh, it could be a movement every six frames. But what it gives is the beats of the shot. Um, it shows the director, the lighting, the composition, all those elements. Um, and then once all those elements have been approved, once you've got a lab that the director's happy with, a block that the director's happy with, then you start the actual filming of the shot. And like I say, that can be anywhere from a day, a shot, up to six to 10 weeks. I think 12 weeks was the longest we did on Pirates on one shot. Um, one key element to our film was the pirate boat and like all the other elements it went through the hand-drawn phase to find all the, all the humour in the design um, before then obviously being designed as a mock-up and a, a final sort of detailed plan. It was quite a large prop as props go, it was about 16 feet high, 14 foot long um, and for the majority of the time was shot in front of green screen so that then the CG team could put in all this sky and sea elements around it. So we we're doing a lot of multiple passes because although the ship did have the ability to pitch, roll, tilt, what it couldn't do is turn corners. We could move it in a straight line on track uh, up to about 50 feet um, but then we also had to put all the lights as well on motion control rigs so we could get the effect of the sun moving round it and also the camera moving round it to give that look of the ship turning. So that's what you can see happening there with the Milo rig. So these shots normally it would be a case that if every shot there would be an animation pass, then there would be tracking passes for VFX. Um, so yeah, quite kind of time consuming work when we were using the ship. And because we only ever had one ship, it cost around £60,000 this model, uh, we weren't in a position to have multiple ships. So you had to make sure this unit was always running efficiently. Um, so there's a lot of pressure. It was basically in use from day one of the shoot uh, for all 78 weeks. So there's a lot of pressure to make sure we got every shot in the time available. You can see it through uh, now just going through the various elements that we do. So this is the tracking pass for VFX that they've got markers in space to put their elements in. Then they put in their basic planes to help the directors kind of get a sense of where the water is going to be, where the sky is going to be. We were often doing this as part of the floor approval process because obviously a director is approving footage, which in many cases is far from finished so he'll see the ship's movement but with no water no sky so we're often trying to add little elements in just to kind of help that process along to make it clearer for the director um, what you're going to see now just for the end of this presentation is um, the chase sequence in the film probably one of the most most complicated parts uh, basically we had three animators working for about like 12 months on this sequence um, and the schedule of it was incredibly challenging because um, all these elements of the inside of um, Charles Darwin's, his, Darwin's house were reused constantly. So basically for one shot to proceed you had to make sure a piece, uh, a stairwell piece or a window piece was free from somewhere else because we didn't want to make a huge amount of this stuff because it, it simply doesn't make financial sense. Also, um, the shots, because the chase sequence are incredibly short and have camera moves in them. Uh, they have to be tested. Anything with a camera move, you need to make sure that that move is absolutely perfect before the animator starts spending time animating. 
So as a kind of rule of thumb, when I was scheduling this section of the film, uh, you were looking at somewhere between three and four weeks per shot for this section. Um, so a very, very labour intensive uh, sequence. Also, we were also looking for ways of saving the animator time on the floor. So elements which were could be motorised basically, like the, the movement of the bathtub, were put on motion control rigs. Uh, so then that the animator could just concentrate on the emotion of the scene, the comedy, uh, and not be distracted by the more technical aspects of it. And now you can see it running through in full. And I guess what we're aiming for with all this kind of work is uh, it needs to look spontaneous and fun and try and retain that kind of spontaneity when you're rehearsing something for four weeks, continually testing it, tweaking it, amending it, you know, and then at the end of the day you still want it to look fresh and kind of uh, vibrant when an audience sees it. So that's part of the challenge really with this sort of sequence. So that is kind of a, a very brief kind of whistle stop tour of our studio and um, because today I know this is mainly a, a technical kind of, uh, sort of gathering I was just happy to open up to questions and stuff really uh, to finish off uh, if anyone's got any questions on the, on the process, the techniques we use. I just ask a very obvious question yes the metal frame that you put inside yeah is that not remote controlled in any manner is that just to hold the puppet up and move the yeah move so basically around? basically this is an armature um, and it's tensioned so that when an animator moves the character into position it kind of holds its position really steadily so that there's no droop when the cam when the animator moves away um, the characters as they exist currently, obviously Ardman's known for working in plasticine, but there's in fact very little plasticine in this character here. Um, the only plasticine that remains is in the brow section here, so the animator can sculpt the kind of eyebrow expressions, etc. Um, his body is made of a foam, um, and then you have latex sections as well, hard resin sections such as the mouth and nose and hat. Um, the reason for this is plasticine is just so time consuming to work with, you have to sculpt it, re-sculpt it, take sections out of it, put them back in again. Uh, foam is a much quicker medium to work in for the animators. Also it's more resilient as well, so this puppet lasts longer. Um, yeah, so that's a kind of where we've moved to with those. And every element as well, it's not just the, the body which is armatured, also like the coattails so that they can hold when he's running you get that sort of look there the little there's wire in his the back of his uh, ponytail as well so every single element to get the weight and movement into the puppet is sort of animatable to some extent any more questions hiya not a technical question, but given how expensive and labour intensive this whole process is, how do new people with new ideas or new projects get a look in, in animation? Um, I think probably not at a features level would be the, the quick answer to that, but animation works at kind of every level, you know, um, children's TV series, a lot of them are making stuff at say £8,000 a minute, you know, which is you know, a world away from what we were doing on Pirates at like a $55 million budget. So yeah, I, 
but then again you know feature films there's feature films made which are a lot less than pirates as well we're at the high end of the stop motion animation um, kind of budget levels um, you know there's films like a tank called panic which would have been made for a fraction of that um, but I think then your audience is going to be a different audience as well you know we're aiming at a large basically Hollywood audience with pirates so I think it can be done it's difficult to do it at a lower budget especially if you want to keep if you want to it depends how far you want to push it what, what you're willing to compromise um, to do it cheaper basically there, there were very few compromises sort of creatively on pirates which is why it cost as much as it did Um, working with the newer materials and the form and whatnot, do you get any remnants like you did with Wallace and Gromit of the fingerprints or anything of the process left over? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see from here, but feel free to kind of have a look afterwards. Um, basically, when you look at these puppets close up, there are very clear sculpt lines um, left in the moulding process. So basically, when this, when this is moulded, it's moulded from a plasticine maquette, but we don't clean up and f make it fine and perfect you know we're not looking for a perfect finish it has to look handmade it has to look like it, it could be made of plasticine um, so when you look at this close up you'll see the marks of the tooling and stuff in his legs especially um, and if there's a foam if there's a fingerprint left in the foam that that's perfectly fine it look that's what we're looking for it's looking for that handmade feel Pirates is quite interesting though in comparison to Wallace and Gromit because Wallace and Gromit is such a chunky kind of look. Um, it's very easy to do that in plasticine, but the detailing on the pirate characters is so fine that it would be physically impossible to sculpt these elements through uh, in plasticine. So it's great that it looks like plasticine, but as a, as a process it, it would be unworkable. You would you wouldn't be able to do anything, it would just fall apart basically, the, the look of these characters in plasticine. You can over there. Can you tell us some more about rapid prototyping and how all that works? Uh, right, rapid prototyping. So, um, I think the first animated film that used rapid prototyping for mouth replacements was Coraline, which was made by a company called Leica. Um, who work in Portland, Oregon. Um, basically, what it is, traditionally we have a set of mouth shapes made of plasticine, normally about 20 mouth pieces, which cover the main phonetic mouth shapes. Um, but then to get all the in-between shapes in plasticine, it's very easy to, to push them and re-sculpt them into slightly different in-between shapes. With rapid prototyping, that's not an option. You have to create every one of those individual pieces. Um, so the kind of process we went through in order to do that was our key animator, Lloyd Price, for each character would create that 20 ma plasticine mouth, mouth pieces of the main phonetic elements. They would then be scanned uh, into Maya and then the Maya artists would rig them so that we could create all the in-betweens as well. So Pirate Captain, for example, has 350 mouth shapes um, for that character. Because um, obviously in plasticine, it's very easy. If you want to make a, an E, an, an E shape, when I say an E, I mean that kind of like E shape into like a happy one, you just push up the edges. But obviously to do that in rapid prototyping, you have to have three three different mouth sets. You have to have a happy E, a relaxed E, and then a sad E. Um, and then also, if you want to do any kind of, if he needs to pull an expression which is, isn't in the phonetic sort of library, so if he wants to go <gasps> like that, you know, pull the lips down, like that, that also has to be designed and built specially. So it's quite a labor intensive process at the front end to, to make this sort of bank of mouths that can be chosen from. Um, but that said, what it allowed us to do was have a cast much greater than we would normally have in a stop motion animated film because the animators weren't having to sculpt all these mouths, place them on individually uh, and then blend this line in. Um, 
So yes, what it what it cost at the front end saved us a lot of time on the studio floor and also allowed us to push the project creatively to be a much sort of grander scale. Does that answer your question or is there anything else? Yeah, expensive. Yes, <laughs> is the bottom line. Is it line. beyond the uh, realms of us mere mortals? Uh, what, for personal use at home? <laughs> no. Well, you know, on a, <laughs> no, a, um, a mid-scale production rather than a, a large... Um, I think it could, it could be outsourced. Um, setting up all the infrastructure internally was um, an expensive process. I, I is it just a 3D printer? It is a 3D printer, but then you obviously had to have the Maya artists as well, uh, the scanner, um, and also... One of the biggest problems, it depends on the scale you want to use it on. Because when we realised early on that we could never print a full mouth set for every character, we basically would still be printing now. Um, we thought well, that this is a massive logistical problem. So then we had to find a way of taking the schedule which I've done of every single shot. So over the 78 weeks and work out where the lines of dialogue might fall phonetically break down those lines of dialogue and then it, for each day of the shoot count which mouths might be needed within that day. So we had to design a computer system to do that so that that was feeding the build schedule of the RP team. Um, so that was like the first hurdle but also then paint and clean up. When it comes out of the RP machine you know that's all automated it's a fairly quick process once you've loaded the information into the machine. But, you know, the, the RP painters were working in shifts, I think three shifts of eight hours each every day, sometimes weekends as well, to keep these mouths coming through. It, you put me off. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's a, it, is, it shouldn't be underestimated. I think it does have its use, and if you can, but also we've used it in a kind of very fine and kind of uh, detailed way. I think maybe if it was like tracked back into a more simplistic approach, um, it could be practical. Hello. You mentioned working with Sony. Um, there was little, little room for compromise, or they it obviously had to be all their their way. When you're animating, how does the structure work? from a director of animation through to the people who actually ap apply the animation. Is there any, are they just literally following an, an instruction from start to finish from a, a senior body or are they allowed to put a little bit of what, of their own animation style into it or is it all very, very generic? Um, okay, uh, so firstly I think we're quite lucky with, with Sony in that being um, being Ardman, we had quite a lot of creative freedom um, on Pirates. That said, we did make numerous changes to the film for the US release because they were un not that Sony were unhappy, but they were concerned that the US market might be unhappy with certain like innuendo and stuff like that. So um, yes, the, Sony did have an influence, but it was quite a uh, it was a good working relationship. But then in terms of how we direct the animation, a lot of that comes down to the director themselves. Um, Pete Lord, who directed Pirates, was very happy for the animators to put a lot of themselves into these every shot. What we try and do is give an animator a scene, so it's a bit like casting a film. When I'm scheduling the shots, I'm looking very much at, for a, an animator who maybe excels in either action work or character work who, who delivers emotion. So each scene is cast in effect to find the right animator to do it. Um, and then the lab rehearsals that you saw on the screen, basically that's repeating out. Some of those lab rehearsals last up to an hour, maybe more, just kind of working through what the beats of the shot are, where, where the emphasis is, where, on which lines and stuff like that. And we're always working before any animation comes through to a, um, a pre-chosen piece of dialogue from the actors but even that is tinkered with by us because I say Hugh Grant might record a line 19 times Pete like, might like the first half of the line in take one but then the second half of take one isn't quite as strong so then we use the next two words from take three and pin them in so basically we, the whole thing is constructed from start to finish so the director does have like 
unbelievable control in what the final thing is going to look and sound like. But I think in the case of Pirates, Pete was very keen to get a lot of the, um, the animators into their shots. Also, each character has a lead animator as well, someone who develops it from being an inanimate object. Um, so before we start shooting with the pirate captain, a guy called Will Beecher worked for about 18 weeks just with the captain, finding out how he stands. You know, because with 33 animators working simultaneously with the same, same character effectively, if he relaxes against a podium, He's got to relax the same way against the podium in every single unit. So you need that consistency. You, the, the rules of that character need to be found before you start filming. It's not to say it doesn't develop, but you need to... His walk style, his looks, you know, how his coat moves, all those things need pinning down and uh, agreeing by the director so that there's a, what we call a bible of animation for each character. Uh, well, uh, if that's it, Thank you very much for listening and feel free to come up and have a look at the puppets and uh, I hope you enjoyed it.